Section five of Daisy Miller by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. She had been walking some quarter of an hour, attended by her two cavaliers, and responding in a tone of very childish gaiety, as it seemed to Winterbourne, to the pretty speeches of Mr. Giovanelli, when a carriage that had detached itself from the revolving train drew up beside the path. At the same moment Winterbourne perceived that his friend Mrs. Walker, the lady whose house he had lately left, was seated in the vehicle and was beckoning to him. Leaving Mrs. Miller's side, he hastened to obey her summons. Mrs. Walker was flushed. She wore an excited air. "'It is really too dreadful,' she said. "'That girl must not do this sort of thing. She must not walk here with you two men. Fifty people have noticed her. Winterbourne raised his eyebrows. I think it's a pity to make too much fuss about it. It's a pity to let the girl ruin herself. She is very innocent, said Winterbourne. She is very crazy, cried Mrs. Walker. Did you ever see anything so imbecile as her mother? After you had all left me just now, I could not sit still for thinking of it. It seemed too pitiful not even to attempt to save her. I ordered the carriage and put on my bonnet and came here as quickly as possible. Thank heaven I have found you. What do you propose to do with us? asked Winterbourne, smiling. To ask her to get in, to drive her about here for half an hour, so that the world may see she is not running absolutely wild, and then to take her safely home. I don't think it's a very happy thought, said Winterbourne. But you can try. Mrs. Walker tried. The young man went in pursuit of Miss Miller, who had simply nodded and smiled at his interlocutor in the carriage, and gone her way with her companion. Daisy, on learning that Mrs. Walker wished to speak to her, retraced her steps with a perfectly good grace, and with Mr. Giovanelli at her side. She declared that she was delighted to have a chance to present this gentleman to Mrs. Walker. She immediately achieved the introduction, and declared that she had never in her life seen anything so lovely as Mrs. Walker's carriage rug. "'I am glad you admire it,' said this lady, smiling sweetly. "'Will you get in and let me put it over you?' "'Oh, no, thank you,' said Daisy. "'I shall admire it much more as I see you driving round with it.' "'Do get in and drive with me,' said Mrs. Walker. "'That would be charming, but it's so enchanting just as I am.' And Daisy gave a brilliant glance at the gentleman on either side of her. It may be enchanting, dear child, but it is not the custom here, urged Mrs. Walker, leaning forward in her victoria with her hands devoutly clasped. Well, it ought to be, then, said Daisy. If I didn't walk, I should expire. You should walk with your mother, dear, cried the lady from Geneva, losing patience. With my mother, dear, exclaimed the young girl. Winterbourne saw that she scented interference. My mother never walked ten steps in her life. And then, you know, she added with a laugh, I am more than five years old. You are old enough to be more reasonable. You are old enough, dear Miss Miller, to be talked about. Daisy looked at Mrs. Walker, smiling intensely. Talked about? What do you mean? Come into my carriage and I will tell you. Daisy turned her quickened glance again from one of the gentlemen beside her to the other. Mr. Giovanelli was bowing to and fro, rubbing down his gloves, and laughing very agreeably. Winterbourne thought it a most unpleasant scene. "'I don't think I want to know what you mean,' said Daisy, presently. "'I don't think I should like it.' Winterbourne wished that Mrs. Walker would tuck in her carriage rug and drive away. But this lady did not enjoy being defied, as she afterward told him. "'Should you prefer being thought a very reckless girl?' she demanded. Gracious! exclaimed Daisy. She looked again at Mr. Giovanelli. Then she turned to Winterbourne. There was a little pink flush in her cheek. She was tremendously pretty. Does Mr. Winterbourne think? she asked, slowly, smiling, throwing back her head and glancing at him from head to foot. That to save my reputation, I ought to get into the carriage. Winterbourne colored. For an instant he hesitated greatly. It seemed so strange to hear her speak that way of her reputation. But he himself, in fact, must speak in accordance with gallantry. 
The finest gallantry here was simply to tell the truth, and the truth for Winterbourne, as the few indications I have been able to give have made him known to the reader, was that Daisy Miller should take Mrs. Walker's advice. He looked at her exquisite prettiness, and then he said, very gently, I think you should get into the carriage. Daisy gave a violent laugh. I have never heard anything so stiff. If this is improper, Mrs. Walker, she pursued, then I'm all improper and you must give me up. Good-bye. I hope you'll have a lovely ride. And with Mr. Giovanelli, who made a triumphantly obsequious salute, she turned away. Mrs. Walker sat looking after her, and there were tears in Mrs. Walker's eyes. "'Get in here, sir,' she said to Winterbourne, indicating the place beside her. The young man answered that he felt bound to accompany Mrs. Miller, whereupon Mrs. Walker declared that, if he refused her this favour, she would never speak to him again. She was evidently in earnest. Winterbourne overtook Daisy and her companion, and, offering the young girl his hand, told her that Mrs. Walker had made an imperious claim upon his society. He expected that in answer she would say something rather free, something to commit himself still further to that recklessness from which Mrs. Walker had so charitably endeavoured to dissuade her. But she only shook his hand, hardly looking at him, while Mr. Giovanelli bade him farewell with a too emphatic flourish of the hat. Winterbourne was not in the best possible humour as he took his seat in Mrs. Walker's Victoria. "'That was not clever of you,' he said, candidly, while the vehicle mingled again with the throng of carriages. "'In such a case,' his companion answered, "'I don't wish to be clever. I wish to be earnest.' "'Well, your earnestness has only offended her and put her off.' "'It has happened very well,' said Mrs. Walker. If she is so perfectly determined to compromise herself, the sooner one knows it the better. One can act accordingly. I suspect she meant no harm. Winterborne rejoined. So I thought a month ago. But she has been going too far. What has she been doing? Everything that is not done here. Flirting with any man she could pick up. Sitting in corners with mysterious Italians dancing all evening with the same partners, receiving visits at eleven o'clock at night. Her mother goes away when visitors come. But her brother, said Winterbourne, laughing, sits up till midnight. He must be edified by what he sees. I'm told that at their hotel everyone is talking about her, and that a smile goes round among all the servants when a gentleman comes and asks for Miss Miller. The servants be hanged said Winterbourne angrily. The poor girl's only fault, he presently added, is that she is very uncultivated. She is naturally indelicate, Mrs. Walker declared. Take that example this morning. How long had you known her at Vivay? A couple of days. Fancy then her making it a personal matter that you should have left the place. Winterbourne was silent for some moments. Then he said, I suspect, Mrs. Walker, that you and I have lived too long at Geneva. And he added a request that she should inform him with what particular design she had made him enter her carriage. I wish to beg you to cease your relations with Miss Miller, not to flirt with her, to give her no further opportunity to expose herself, to let her alone, in short. I'm afraid I can't do that, said Winterbourne. I like her extremely. All the more reason that you shouldn't help her to make a scandal. There shall be nothing scandalous in my attentions to her. There certainly will be in the way she takes them. But I have said what I had on my conscience. Mrs. Walker pursued. If you wish to rejoin the young lady, I will put you down. Here, by the way, you have a chance. The carriage was traversing that part of the Pincian Garden that overhangs the wall of Rome and overlooks the beautiful Villa Borghese. It is bordered by a large parapet, near which there are several seats. One of the seats at a distance was occupied by a gentleman and a lady, toward whom Mrs. Walker gave a toss of her head. At the same moment these persons rose and walked toward the parapet. Winterbourne had asked the coachman to stop. He now descended from the carriage. His companion looked at him a moment in silence. Then, while he raised his hat, she drove majestically away. 
Winterbourne stood there. He had turned his eyes toward Daisy and her cavalier. They evidently saw no one. They were too deeply occupied with each other. When they reached the low garden wall, they stood a moment looking off at the great flat-topped pine clusters of the Villa Borghese. Then Giovanelli seated himself, familiarly, upon the broad ledge of the wall. The western sun in the opposite sky sent out a brilliant shaft through a couple of cloud bars, whereupon Daisy's companion took her parasol out of her hands and opened it. She came a little nearer, and he held the parasol over her. Then, still holding it, he let it rest upon her shoulder, so that both of their heads were hidden from Winterbourne. This young man lingered a moment, then he began to walk. But he walked not toward the couple with the parasol, toward the residence of his aunt, Mrs. Costello. He flattered himself on the following day that there was no smiling among the servants when he, at least, asked for Mrs. Miller at her hotel. This lady and her daughter, however, were not at home, and on the next day after, repeating his visit, Winterbourne again had the misfortune not to find them. Mrs. Walker's party took place on the evening of the third day, and in spite of the frigidity of his last interview with his hostess, Winterbourne was among the guests. Mrs. Walker was one of those American ladies who, while residing abroad, make a point, in their own phrase, of studying European society, and she had, on this occasion, collected several specimens of her diversely born fellow mortals to serve, as it were, as textbooks. When Winterbourne arrived, Daisy Miller was not there, but in a few moments he saw her mother come in alone, very shyly and ruefully. Mrs. Miller's hair above her exposed-looking temples was more frizzled than ever. As she approached Mrs. Walker, Winterbourne also drew near. "'You see I've come all alone,' said poor Mrs. Miller. "'I'm so frightened I don't know what to do. It's the first time I've ever been to a party alone, especially in this country. I wanted to bring Randolph or Eugenia or someone, but Daisy just pushed me off by myself. I ain't used to going round alone.' "'And does not your daughter intend to favour us with her society?' demanded Mrs. Walker impressively. "'Well, Daisy's all dressed,' said Mrs. Miller, with that accent of the dispassionate, if not of the philosophic historian, with which she always recorded the current incidents of her daughter's career. "'She got dressed on purpose before dinner. But she's got a friend of hers there, that gentleman, the Italian, that she wanted to bring. They've got going at the piano. It seems as if they couldn't leave off. Mr. Giovanelli sings splendidly, but I guess they'll come before very long," concluded Mrs. Miller, hopefully. "'I'm sorry she should come in that way,' said Mrs. Walker. "'Well, I told her there was no use in her getting dressed before dinner if she was going to wait three hours,' responded Daisy's mamma. I didn't see the use of her putting on such a dress as that to sit round with Mr. Giovanelli. This is most horrible, said Mrs. Walker, turning away and addressing herself to Winterbourne. It's a fiche. It's her revenge for my having ventured to remonstrate with her. When she comes I shall not speak to her. Daisy came after eleven o'clock, but she was not, on such an occasion, a young lady to wait to be spoken to. She rustled forward in radiant loveliness, smiling and chattering, carrying a large bouquet, and attended by Mr. Giovanelli. Every one stopped talking and turned and looked at her. She came straight to Mrs. Walker. I'm afraid you thought I never was coming, so I sent Mother off to tell you. I wanted to make Mr. Giovanelli practice some things before he came. You know he sings beautifully, and I want you to ask him to sing. This is Mr. Giovanelli. You know I introduced him to you. He's got the most lovely voice, and he knows the most charming set of songs. I made him go over them this evening on purpose. We had the greatest time at the hotel. Of all this, Daisy delivered herself with the sweetest, brightest audibleness, looking now at her hostess and now round the room, while she gave a series of little pats round her shoulders to the edges of her dress. Is there anyone I know? she asked. I think everyone knows you, said Mrs. Walker, pregnantly and she gave a very cursory greeting to Mr. Giovanelli. This gentleman bore himself gallantly. He smiled and bowed and showed his white teeth. He curled his moustaches and rolled his eyes and performed all the proper functions of a handsome Italian at an evening party. 
he sang very prettily half a dozen songs, though Mrs. Walker afterward declared that she had been quite unable to find out who asked him. It was apparently not Daisy who had given him his orders. Daisy sat at a distance from the piano, and though she had publicly, as it were, professed a high admiration for his singing, talked not inaudibly while it was going on. It's a pity these rooms are so small. We can't dance she said to Winterbourne, as if she had seen him five minutes before. "'I am not sorry we can't dance,' Winterbourne answered. "'I don't dance.' "'Of course you don't dance. You're too stiff,' said Miss Daisy. "'I hope you enjoyed your drive with Mrs. Walker.' "'No, I didn't enjoy it. I preferred walking with you.' "'We paired off. That was much better,' said Daisy. But did you ever hear anything so cool as Mrs. Walker's wanting me to get into her carriage and drop poor Mr. Giovanelli, and under the pretext that it was proper? People have different ideas. It would have been most unkind. He had been talking about that walk for ten days. He should not have talked about it at all, said Winterbourne. He would never have proposed to a young lady of this country to walk about the streets with him. About the streets? cried Daisy with her pretty stare. Where, then, would he have proposed to her to walk? The Pincio is not the streets, either. And I, thank goodness, am not a young lady of this country. The young ladies of this country have a dreadfully pokey time of it, so far as I can learn. I don't see why I should change my habits for them. I'm afraid your habits are those of a flirt, said Winterbourne gravely. Of course they are, she cried, giving him a little smiling stare again. I'm a fearful, frightful flirt. Did you ever hear of a nice girl that was not? But I suppose you will tell me now that I am not a nice girl. You're a very nice girl, but I wish you would flirt with me, and me only, said Winterbourne. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. You are the last man I should think of flirting with. As I have had the pleasure of informing you, you are too stiff. You say that too often, said Winterbourne. Daisy gave a delighted laugh. If I could have the sweet hope of making you angry, I should say it again. Don't do that. When I am angry, I am stiffer than ever. But if you won't flirt with me, do cease, at least, to flirt with your friend at the piano. They don't understand that sort of thing here. I thought they understood nothing else, exclaimed Daisy. Not in young unmarried women. It seems to me much more proper in young unmarried women than in old married ones. Well, said Winterbourne, when you deal with natives, you must go by the custom of the place. Flirting is purely an American custom. It doesn't exist here. So when you show yourself in public with Mr. Giovanelli and without your mother— Gracious! Poor mother! interposed Daisy. Though you may be flirting, Mr. Giovanelli is not. He means something else. He isn't preaching at any rate, said Daisy with vivacity. And if you want very much to know, we are neither of us flirting. We are two good friends for that. We are very intimate friends. Ah, rejoined Winterbourne, if you are in love with each other, it is another affair. She had allowed him up to this point to talk so frankly that he had no expectation of shocking her by this ejaculation. But she immediately got up, blushing visibly, and leaving him to exclaim mentally that little American flirts were the queerest creatures in the world. Mr. Giovanelli, at least, she said, giving her interlocutor a single glance. Never says such very disagreeable things to me. Winterbourne was bewildered. He stood staring. Mr. Giovanelli had finished singing. He left the piano and came over to Daisy. Won't you come into the other room and have some tea? He asked, bending before her with his ornamental smile. Daisy turned to Winterbourne, beginning to smile again. He was still more perplexed. For this inconsequent smile made nothing clear, though it seemed to prove, indeed, that she had a sweetness and softness that reverted instinctively to the pardon of offences. It has never occurred to Mr. Winterbourne to offer me any tea, she said, with her little tormenting manner. I have offered you advice, Winterbourne rejoined. I prefer weak tea, cried Daisy, and she went off with the brilliant Giovanelli. She sat with him in the adjoining room, in the embrasure of the window, for the rest of the evening. There was an interesting performance at the piano, but neither of these young people gave heed to it. 
When Daisy came to take leave of Mrs. Walker, this lady conscientiously repaired the weakness of which she had been guilty at the moment of the young girl's arrival. She turned her back straight upon Miss Miller, and left her to depart with what grace she might. Winterbourne was standing near the door. He saw it all. Daisy looked very pale, and looked at her mother, but Mrs. Miller was humbly unconscious of any violation of the usual social forms. She appeared, indeed, to have felt an incongruous impulse to draw attention to her own striking observance of them. "'Good night, Mrs. Walker,' she said. "'We've had a beautiful evening. You see, if I let Daisy come to parties without me, I don't want her to go away without me.' Daisy turned away, looking with a pale, grave face at the circle near the door. Winterbourne saw that, for the first moment, she was too much shocked and puzzled even for indignation. He, on his side, was greatly touched. "'That was very cruel,' he said to Mrs. Walker. "'She never enters my drawing-room again,' replied his hostess. End of section 5